Good evening, everyone. A few weeks ago, there was some conversation uh, around disease X. And uh, because we are still in the pandemic, this is the fourth year of the pandemic, a lot of questions were asked about what is disease X. And uh, a lot of fear as well, given the lessons of the pandemic, particularly the second wave in India that has taught us. Everybody is obviously fearful about what lies ahead as far as our health is concerned. So to talk about disease X, to talk about COVID and a lot more, uh, because uh, we could be in the fourth year of the pandemic, but the threat from an unknown pathogen is far from over. To talk about what lies ahead and what can we expect, when is going to be the new pandemic, the next pandemic, is it going to be in the next 100 years or five years or 10 years and are we ready or not? Professor Ramanan Lakshmi Narayan is with us, a well-known epidemiologist. He's done a lot of work around COVID, uh, including giving data about uh, deaths, about uh, the outcomes of uh, uh, this disease. And he's uh, the director of One uh, Health Trust. He's joining us today. And I want to begin by asking you, uh, Professor, what is this fear that we should, uh, what is this concern about uh, disease X, first of all? And a lot of people ask, what is disease X? Is it lurking around the corner? Do we have any specifics about it, any specific information about it? What do you have to tell us about disease X? Well, thank you. Thanks for that question, and thanks for having me. Um, uh, you know, clearly COVID has receded mm. from people's minds because obviously, you know, if it were there, a lot more people would be concerned about it. But that's mm. the nature of how we think about pandemics. We don't think of them between pandemics. Disease X simply refers to the fact that there is potentially another pandemic uh, around the corner. We don't know when it will be, and we don't know what the causative pathogen will be. But we know it's going to happen for a number of reasons. Uh, we know it's going to happen because, take coronaviruses. Now we're all, everybody knows the word coronavirus, which you know was not popularly known. Coronaviruses typically cause the common cold. But just in the last 20 years, we've had three coronaviruses that have caused serious illnesses. SARS-1, which fortunately for reasons we don't know just died out. Uh, MERS, the Middle Eastern uh, Respiratory Syndrome, which is, uh, you know, is transmitted from camels. Fortunately, we don't really have it in India, but uh, uh, it's common, common in the Middle East. Very, very high fatality rate. 60% of people who get MERS actually die. And then we, of course, have SARS-CoV-2, which, uh, which is what you know, everyone here has experienced. So you've had three coronavirus-related diseases that have spread globally in just 20 years. Now, why is that the case? We similarly have drug-resistant pathogens, where India has actually got the highest number of drug-resistant pathogens, you know, in terms of, of disease burden in the world. We again don't know, you know, we, we know that one of them is going to take off. We just don't know which one it is right now. Uh, we have bird flu, which is now decimating both bird populations as well as mammal populations around the world. The reason we're concerned about it is because uh, bird flu, H5N1, has been known since 1996. But it is now transmitting very effectively from mammal to mammal, from seals to other seals, from sea lions to other sea lions. It's in pigeons. It's certainly in domesticated you know, mm -hmm. poultry. Uh, it's uh, you know, killing off lots of exotic wild species as well. So then the question is, at what point does it figure out not just how to jump to humans, because it has already jumped to humans, mm. it is, you know, people have died from bird flu, but it has not successfully jumped from one human to another yet. So when that happens, this becomes your disease X, which mm. then hits the headline news and then people worry about it. But on any given day of the year or the week, some disease is trying to jump from animals to humans uh, because that's where the evolutionary lottery is, and that's where they win. You spoke about bird flu, H5N1. A lot of experts have spoken about the fact that that is going to cause the next pandemic. I just want to ask you about the risk factor as far as the fatality rates are concerned. Given that the COVID fatality rates were very less as compared to what it could be for, say, the Zika virus, for example. What about bird flu? So the only examples mm -hmm. we have from bird flu, H5N1, are uh, the few deaths that we've had uh, around the world, including, I believe, one in India a couple of years back, mm -hmm. uh, where the fatality rates are between 30 and 60%. So just to put that in perspective, mm -hmm. uh, COVID-19, 
uh, the fatality rate was two out of every thousand. So thousand people got COVID, two would, you know, mm. two people would die. With bird flu, out of a thousand, that number is 600. Now, I don't want to scare mm. you with, you know, imagining that this is going to be some widespread fatality event just yet. But the potential exists because this disease is trying to make its way into mm -hmm. humans. And like I said, it is now in widespread in wildlife populations now and mm -hmm. is decimating wildlife populations. And of course, you know, we're paying attention to that for that reason. Mm -hmm. But it is a very high fatality rate. You know, uh, also I want to ask you, pathogens are zoonotic in nature. What is it that we are doing wrong? Where are we going wrong? Because uh, we still talk a lot about the origins of COVID. A lot has been said about the wet market in Wuhan. Uh, you know, it's still up in the air. But I just, I just want to ask you, how is it that so many pathogens are from, you know, I have, a, have an origin from uh, the, the zoonotic origin, essentially, is what I'm asking you. So uh, pathogens are either already in humans, in which case we have some level mm -hmm. of protection, mm -hmm. immune response to them and protected mm -hmm. from them, uh, like COVID is now. So SARS-CoV-2, we already have it. Mm -hmm. We have antibodies to it. So you know, in a sense, it's not mm -hmm. likely to be a, a major pandemic again mm -hmm. of that same kind, which is uh, uh, which everyone has to worry about. The reason zoonotic viruses are problematic is because we have no experience with them from an immune perspective. Yes. Our bodies have never seen them. So when they figure out, when I say figure out, it's not like they're thinking about it. This is just, you know, evolution at work. When it works out that they're able to transmit from person to person and are successful at doing so, mm -hmm. Our bodies have no experience with them, just like our bodies had no experience with COVID mm -hmm. back in 2020. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we're at risk for any pathogen that comes from animals that we have no prior experience mm -hmm. with. So a known enemy is uh, better than an unknown enemy. And in this case, this, is, this enemy is unknown. Oh, without question. I mean, mm -hmm. certainly there are viruses that we really don't have experience. Most of us would mm -hmm. not have experience with, like HIV, for instance. But that's for reasons that we've protected ourselves. Uh, but for other flu viruses, lots of respiratory viruses, many, many other pathogens, we, we've experienced them in some way or shape mm -hmm. or form. So, you know, I want to ask you, what is it that we can do, given that you, among other epidemiologists and experts world over, have spoken about the fact the WHO has just spoken about it, that the next pandemic is not going to be 100 years from now. It will be in the next 5 to 10 years, and we are not prepared for it. So what can we do to be prepared? Well, there's, uh, remember that what is changing now, why this is now mm. getting to be uh, more common, why mm. we think it's going to be in the next five to 10 years, is simply because uh, first, there are more humans on the planet. Mm. So if you take the entire biomass, you know, you take in the weight of mammals on this planet, we humans are one third of that. The animals that we consume, uh, well, not all of us consume them, but certainly pigs and cattle mm. constitute another you know, 60%. The remaining 10% is all the elephants and the zebras and the horses and the dogs and cats. That's mm. the remaining you know, 10%. So there's a huge evolutionary win for pathogens to get to us, especially you know, viruses that are trying to mm. make that jump. So it makes it, it's like, you know, we're like the Taj buffet and you know, do you want to eat at the small tea shop outside? Or do you want to eat at the Taj buffet? You all know the answer to that. This is what is going on there. This is really the evolutionary win. Same thing with birds as well. Poultry, mostly chicken and turkey, constitute 90% of the bird biomass on the planet. 90%. Every other sparrow, eagle, you know, crow that you've seen is all the remaining 10%. So again, it makes sense again, for viruses, mm. you know, to this is where the evolutionary success comes from. So one is this, we've changed the planet in terms of what the biomass really is mm. in and around us. So we are primarily that. The second reason is because um, of climate change. So climate change, typically zoonotic diseases occur when diseases spread from one animal species to another animal species, typically it's to a domesticated animal because that is closer to us in a sense. And that jump is happening more and more because climate change is pushing species that would never come into contact with each other now in contact because they're all moving, right? They are mm -hmm. keeping up with you know, where the warm season is, the cold season is, and all of that. So 
climate change is a huge driver of it. Another element of climate change, of course, is you know things like the melting of the Arctic permafrost. Um, so the Siberian permafrost contains a lot of viruses and bacteria that uh, were buried there well before humans ever came on the planet. Mm. We've only been around, you know, to some extent, only for the last you know one to three million years ago, mm. uh, and these all predate us. So what climate change is exposing a lot of that. The third reason is really just the speed of travel which is that a virus in Wuhan can reach you know, Toronto, or it can reach New Delhi, or it can reach uh, you know, Johannesburg, literally within the time that it takes for a flight to get there. And that speed of travel mm -hmm. just means that it's very hard to contain anything. In the old days when it was just a ship, you could quarantine the ship, mm -hmm. or you could you know, keep it away. Um, you know, cholera pandemics, there have been many cholera pandemics, they all would emerge in the Bay of Bengal, and they would spread slowly over many years mm -hmm. until eventually they would kill a lot of people in New York or Philadelphia or Baltimore. Mm -hmm. But that process would take years. Today, that process will take literally days. Not even. I mean, mm -hmm. how long does it take for a flight mm -hmm. to get from uh, from Dhaka mm -hmm. or, or Calcutta to get into uh, the East Coast mm -hmm. of the US? You all know the answer to that. So that speed makes a difference. So mm -hmm. these are three major reasons why this is happening. So we are in the fourth year of the pandemic. Yes, the global emergency associated with the pandemic is over. We know that. But the COVID pandemic. Yes, the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of people, um, you know, would want to know what next. When are we going to be declared pandemic free is, is the question. And does that even matter? Where are we as far as the pandemic is concerned? Is the threat still around or is, is the worst over? So there are... Remember, viruses are always experiencing what is called antigenic drift. So they basically mm. are changing just a little bit when they copy mm. themselves. They make some errors or they figure out what helps them. That's how evolution works. So there's always going to be new subtypes mm. that are going to be dangerous to us. And potentially, we'll have to get mm. new vaccines for mm. COVID, you know, maybe every other year or, you know, every two, three years or whatever. Um, but COVID is never going to leave us. So mm. we're always going to have COVID amongst us mm. forever. There is no, there's no getting away from this at mm. all. Uh, potentially, if a subtype uh, is more virulent, which means it mm. kills more people, it's likely to be more of an issue for the elderly population based on mm. our history with COVID. You can't always predict the future, but mm. generally, you know, influenza viruses have typically you know, been more mm. fatal for uh, the elderly population, and COVID was definitely far mm. more dangerous for the elderly population. As you all know, if you're above 65, your risk of dying from COVID was 100 times greater than mm. if you're in your 20s. Much, much different. Mm. So uh, the unfortunate answer is there is no end to COVID. It mm. is here to stay with us. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I doubt that we'll have a repeat of what we had in 2021, for instance, mm -hmm. because at that stage, we had no immunity to it. You know, I also want to ask you, and this is related to COVID as well, around uh, during COVID, and I think we later, we realized this much later, uh, there was a lot of misuse of drugs, including antibiotics that was prescribed even during COVID, which was absolutely unnecessary. Talk to us a li little about the problem that there is in India and outside India as far as drug resistance is concerned. And how is this hugely problematic for those people who are dealing with life-threatening diseases? And you just realize that you are resistant to this drug uh, and there is no way out of the disease then. Yeah, uh, this is actually a problem that is not in the future for India. Mm. It is there right now. Um, antibiotics are hugely misused, uh, mm. you know, across South Asia uh, because we have the combination of cheaper antibiotics. There are hundreds of companies that are making antibiotics. Second is rising incomes. Everybody mm. now in rural areas can now afford them, which is a good thing, by the way. And uh, the third thing is that they're easily available. Without a prescription, you can walk mm. up to the pharmacy. You don't have to go anywhere fancy. Mm. You can go to the airport, you know, the pharmacy at the mm. airport, and you can say you have a stomach problem. They will give you an antibiotic. Exactly. Most people wouldn't know an antibiotic if, you know, even if mm. they got one, because mm. it doesn't say antibiotic on it. It has mm. the name of some drug on it. You just sort of take it, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, fluoroquinolones, norfloxacin, is very commonly used here mm. for... Uh, for, uh, you know, just for, you know, traveler's diarrhea mm. kind of stuff. Mm. Now, what that has resulted in is that the bacteria, so 
most people also don't realize that antibiotics only work with bacteria. bacteria. They don't mm -hmm. work for viruses. Mm -hmm. But still, any cold, anything, people take an antibiotic. And uh, as a result, the bacteria have become resistant to the antibiotics, mm -hmm. which means that they no longer respond mm -hmm. to the antibiotic. This is a global problem. Uh, antibiotic resistance is now the third leading cause of death in the world. Third leading cause mm -hmm. of death in the world you know, after, you know, mm -hmm. non-communicable diseases. And uh, something like five million people die every year worldwide because of deaths associated with drug-resistant infections. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are in India itself. Mm -hmm. Now, for the reasons I mentioned, uh, we cannot change that trajectory unless we do one of two things. One is we prevent the diseases through more vaccination, uh, better water and sanitation, you know, better mm -hmm. hygiene, uh, and through better infection prevention and control in hospitals. And the second is to really stop mm -hmm. taking antibiotics where they're not needed. This is not just a societal problem. Mm -hmm. For each of us, when we take antibiotics inappropriately, we put ourselves at risk, we put people immediately around us at mm -hmm. risk. Um, and I think I was mentioning to you just before this, you know, mm -hmm. my daughter who spent quite a few years in Delhi before, uh, the first time she ever had an infection, it was drug resistant. Mm -hmm. Uh, to all but one antibiotic. She had never had antibiotics in her life. So mm. that could happen to anyone, right? So this mm. could happen to any of us because, uh, because those bacteria are everywhere. I mean, mm. we're literally, you know, we're surrounded by bacteria at mm. every moment of our lives. They're on every surface. They're in the air around mm. us. So there's no escaping the bacteria. We're like fish in this ocean of bacteria. Mm. So anything we do to mess with that population, it's going to come back to us immediately. So what could have been the source of... Uh you know, the, the very fact that she was resistant to just so many medicines, just so many antibiotics, in spite of the fact that she had not ever taken an antibiotic all her life. So what could have been the reason behind the resistance then? Because we're modifying everything, right? Mm -hmm. So it's in the water, it's in every other place. Mm -hmm. It could be in food. So for instance, mm -hmm. uh, if, uh, you know, women who uh, consume chicken, mm -hmm. which has been raised on antibiotics, have a higher mm -hmm. risk of developing drug-resistant urinary mm -hmm. tract infections. And up to the age of 65, women have, a, unfortunately, a higher risk of UTIs mm. than, than, than men do. After that, it evens mm. out. Now, uh, that's because it's in our food. It's mm. in the water. It's in, you know, it's in every surface really around mm. us. So uh, nobody has to go out and be exposed mm. particularly to drug-resistant bacteria. The bacteria have just become drug-resistant all around us. You know, there's been some conversation around chicken. A lot of people love chicken. I love chicken. I just want to ask you, what is it that poultry does in terms of, you know, uh, a uh, blocking or, or, or preventing that, uh, or rather uh, ensuring that we are we then become resistant to just so many medicines, given that our poultry we know is fed with antibiotics. Plus, as far as climate change is concerned, we've spoken about uh, climate change and how it is deeply related to health, deeply related to disease X and pathogens, known and unknown. What is it that poultry does is what I want to know, because India is a country that consumes poultry, our consumption is high. We are a chicken-eating country. So just talk to us a little about that. So full disclosure, uh, I'm vegetarian, but I don't mean to mm. imply that anyone should be mm. vegetarian. That's not the idea. We should not be... We should. We can eat chicken, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, you can eat chicken, but you have to realize that the more chicken you eat that is raised on antibiotics, you are putting yourself at risk as far as drug-resistant infections mm -hmm. go because these chickens are now raised mm -hmm. on antibiotics. This practice has now changed in Europe. It's changed in the United States and the U.S. It happened in about 2014, 2015, uh, where, uh, you know, quite rapidly, the poultry industry moved away from using antibiotics mm -hmm. at all. It's not something that's beyond the reach of Indian industry to do. It can easily do that as well. Uh, but it is just that it's like, you know, it's like driving an SUV and climate change. Mm. It doesn't mean that you don't drive anywhere, but you have to be mindful of the fact that every time you're driving, you're contributing to climate change. That's the same thing with the chicken issue, mm. which is the more you consume, there's a greater risk, both for yourself and everyone around you. Uh, but that just is the nature of, you know, what that risk is. And uh, as far as climate change itself goes, I think that's more associated with livestock, mm. really, than, than chicken, mostly to do with methane mm. and those emissions. I think, you know, 15% of global mm. carbon emissions are related, related to livestock. Uh, India does have a lot of livestock, by the way. Mm. Uh, in fact, India has more livestock than China, the European Union, and mm. the U.S. all put together. So, but 
those livestock are not being consumed per mm. se those mm. are just out there uh, but that's a different question but but as far as chicken goes i think uh, we do want to be mindful of the health impacts that it does have mm. you know uh, coming back to disease x a couple of questions first of all uh, are we prepared uh, is india prepared is is my question to you i'll come to the developed countries in a bit from now but first of all is india prepared so there is no such thing as mm. a country necessarily mm. being prepared beyond just having mm. good, a good public health system mm. so what does that preparedness really mean it means having good disease surveillance it's getting better for sure here it's about having the healthcare facilities not just in urban areas but also in rural areas there's certainly improvements on that front although a lot more needs to happen mm. on that front it means about having better vaccination coverage which india has improved quite a bit in the last mm. you know the last 10 years vaccination coverage has has increased it's about water and sanitation uh it's about infection prevention in hospitals mm. so i think these are indicators that need much more focus but certainly mm. improving over time uh beyond that there is not a specific preparation per se mm. for a disease x because very likely this disease will emerge from outside of the country right it could happen mm. from southeast asia which is where a lot of these viruses typically at least historically have come from mm. but there are, if the disease x happens to be a fungal pathogen it could happen from right here we didn't talk mm. much about fungal mm. pathogens those are problematic because there are no vaccines and we have very very few drugs to treat those with uh we saw mucomycosis mm. black fungus during covid, COVID. terrible and mm. fungal pathogens are now increasing because of climate change uh and they're getting to be much much more deadly um we don't observe them because we're not seeing the numbers up yet but it'll happen as far as drug resistant bacteria go there's already the problem in india so this is something which public health has to really reckon with make sure that antibiotics are used less in the cities in rural areas they do need more antibiotics because a lot of people do die because of lack mm. of antibiotics so there needs more but less certainly in the urban areas so i think these are what india can do to prepare but the mm. major preparation will have to be in cooperating with other countries like through the pandemic accord mm. which is now being discussed at the world health organization to be able to ensure that when a disease actually occurs wherever it is that everyone gets to know about it we are in it together we are all in it together mm. this is like climate change you can't fight it country by country mm. it has to be you know global mm. the second is that we cooperate with other countries to make sure that uh a vaccine will be quickly available for everyone india mm. was fortunate to have vaccine manufacturing capacity mm. a lot of poor countries you know in africa for instance did not have access to vaccines and they are very upset about it naturally mm. so uh, that equity also needs to be there because we heard this during covid you know uh none of us is safe unless all of us are safe mm -hmm. and i think we don't really pay attention to what that really means it really is true if there are people somewhere else with the disease we are all immediately at risk right you know uh, for those uh, who may actually not know what a pandemic accord will entail what does it really mean to have a pandemic accord why is it important to have a pandemic accord given that the who has been stressing on it for a while now just talk to us a little about what that is going to mean and how is it going to help us even in an eventuality of yet another pandemic right so i'll just mm. you know step back a little bit because you know the world agrees on certain things right Uh, you know the montreal protocol for ozone or or say on on uh, paris accords for climate for instance before the world agreed on anything the world more than 170 years ago agreed that diseases had to be reported why because if neighbor has a disease and i don't know about it then i am at risk immediately so the idea that countries would cooperate on disease is a very old idea it goes back to the 1850s way before anything else but that said those are those protocols have not kept up with the needs of today where like i said someone with a disease can you know spread it mm. across the world in you know 12 hours and what that really requires is countries cooperating in preventing mm. predicting and reporting and then responding to pandemics mm. uh now the lack of agreement globally is because not everyone wants to be able to share information because they are worried that if i share information about a mm. pandemic if it doesn't turn out to be the case then you will impose sanctions on me and then my economy will go down or uh, if i'm making vaccines i want it just for my people first before i give it to anyone else so in a large way we're going about pandemic preparedness 
thinking we can fight this country by country without realizing that we're all in it together. And when I say this, I don't mean India per se. There's a lot of disagreement going on right now globally on how to get countries to cooperate. And to cooperate, it is for every country to see that they have a self-interest in everyone else also being protected. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, that's usually not how countries mm -hmm. interact with each other in these fora. So we're having a bit of a problem with getting that uh, agreement going. The deadline was supposed to be that this will be adopted at the World Health Assembly in May this year. Uh, it's looking quite difficult that we'll get a pandemic accord this year. Uh, there's a global pandemic fund that was sent up under the World Bank and you know total amount that they have is a small fraction of what was required. So somehow, after millions of people dying around the world, two years later, everyone has forgotten and gone home and gone on to the next problem. Mm -hmm. And we've forgotten that this is actually still a threat which is mm -hmm. going to come up next. So, uh, I mean, it's just the nature of, of us as humans, right? No we lessons learned. No, no lessons, lessons learned. learned. We forget very quickly and then we'll be surprised mm -hmm. when the next pandemic also comes along. So, uh, mm -hmm. but... Like I, was, yes, like I was telling you, I think the problem really is that until the time it really hits us, yes. the, then the problem comes knocking at our doors. I think we don't realize the significance of... of, of you know, putting our focus and attention on things that actually matter, and I think that really is our health. Yeah, it's like a prediction of yes. you know, bad news, right? Who wants a prediction of bad news? Yes, and that's what epidemiologists do, and that's why, you know, we're not particularly popular that <laughs> way. But, you know, when you come back, this is what is going to mm -hmm. happen. This is as clockwork as, uh, as mm -hmm. anything else. Nature works in a fairly predictable way. Mm -hmm. All right, that was an insightful conversation. I'm going to thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I think the big takeaway really from here is that the pandemic, like we would think, a lot of people say that it's a way, uh, you know, the Spanish flu hit us in the year 1914, 1915, 1918. 1918. So it was 100 years ago, and the next is going to be 100 years from now. Oh, we won't be around. I think that really is not true. And I think uh, the sooner we realize that, the better. I hope so. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.